11 a.m. here in East Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, Madam, Miss You, good morning, Buju to Le Monde. Welcome to our webinar today as we commemorate the International Youth Day 2021. Each year on the 12th of August, the International Youth Day is celebrated as it was endorsed by the General Assembly in 1999 to acknowledge and amplify the importance of youth participation in current affairs. I am your moderator, Asenath Mithiga. I am a program analyst at United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, Kenya Country Office. And um, one of the things that we had requested the young people is to send a quote. And one of and my quotes today is, I believe that we must cultivate youth power through movement building to end harmful practices, including FGM globally. This webinar has been organized by FCDO funded Africa led movement to end FGM C program. That is a consortium comprising of options UK, AMREF Health Africa, ActionAid UK, Orchid Project, ACAF, University of Portsmouth and Population Council in partnership with UNFPA Kenya, Anti-FGM Board, a Global Media Campaign to End FGMC, Africa Coalition, Youth Coalition on Ending FGMC and Child Marriage, Youth Anti-FGM Network Kenya and Y Act. The theme for our webinar today <coughs> is uh, Building Back Better from COVID-19, Tackling FGMC with African Youth as Strategic Partners. So welcome, Karibuni Sana. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to us our panelists who have been drawn from five countries. Uh, to set us off is Leshan Kereto. He is a member of UNFPA Youth Advisory Panel and founder of Kereto Africa. He's a student leader mm -hmm. and an active anti-FGM activist and a member of uh, the Youth um, Advisory Panel, as I've mentioned. He's a medical student and uh, a sexual and reproductive health advocate having founded Tereto Africa, a community-based organization that is widely involved in sexual and reproductive health, mainly focusing on ending FGM, gender-based violence, and sex for parts. Say hi, Leshan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. It's very exciting to be here today. Thank you, Leshan. Next is Hiwot Girma. She's a, a member of AMREF Youth Advisory Group. Hiwot is a clinical pharmacist at uh, Gandhi Memorial Hospital and serves as a focal point person in drug information services. She's an advocate of universal health coverage and has been equipping young people in Ethiopia with basic advocacy skills to demand for better health services in their communities. Hi, Girma. Is she with us? Okay, next is Nathaniel Louis Agustin Tete, a Scout Commissioner and Assistant Trainer, President of the National Youth Committee. He's, he comes from Senegal. He's a youth entrepreneur who is passionate about ICT. He's a lawyer by training. He's also a Deputy Commissioner and Leader of the Senegalese Scout Movement, responsible for implementation of Scout Global Support Assessment Tool at the national level. Bonjour, Nathaniel. Thank you, Sandra. We have Dr. Miriam Dahir. She's the chairperson of Youth and FGM Network Somaliland. Uh, she's a medical doctor and health systems specialist, passionate about gender equality, sexual and reproductive health rights, and human rights. Uh, who joined Ending FGM Effort and um, Women Rights Advocacy in Somaliland in the year 2012. Hi, Miriam. Hi, everybody. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Lastly, not least, we have Diaka Selena Koroma. She's the founder and director of Girls Empowerment Sierra Leone. She's a brilliant, vibrant social entrepreneur, a farmer, and an environmental activist. She mentors girls on ending GBV, sexual and reproductive health issues, and works with communities through community educational programs on the rights of women and the girl child. Welcome, Diaka. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. You're welcome. And now for our opening remarks, uh, we are very privileged to have uh, Jayatma. Jayatma is the UN Secretary General's envoy on youth. 
uh, she works to expand the United Nations youth engagement and that focus here for across all four pillars of work that's on sustainable development, human rights, <coughs> peace and security, and humanitarian action. And she serves as the representative of and the advisor to the Secretary General. She could not be here with us. She sent us a video, so I'll request that we play the video for the welcoming remarks. Over. Happy International Youth Day, everyone. My name is Jatma Vikramanayake, and I am the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. It is a pleasure to be connecting with young people all over the world to celebrate this important day. It's incredible to think that young people like you and me make up the largest generation that our world has ever seen. With the collective power of more than 1.8 billion young people globally, our generation has the opportunity to be the largest driving force to create meaningful change and to help achieve a more equal and sustainable future for all of us. But we are not only the largest generation of change makers, we are also the most interconnected one. The young people of today are digital natives that have been contributing to the resilience of their communities and countries, proposing innovative solutions, driving social progress, and inspiring transparent and inclusive political change. Time and time again, we see young people at the front lines of developing new solutions and becoming pillars of their communities, despite facing multi-dimensional challenges in their day-to-day -day lives. Today's youth continue to face the devastating impacts of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which has put millions of vulnerable young people at risk for their physical and mental health, while also increasingly coping with the fear of unemployment and being out of school. At the same time, young people also disproportionately find themselves facing the irreversible impacts of the climate crisis that threatens the survival of our planet. Yet, despite all of this, young people continuously lead the way in safeguarding the future, making sure that progress and solutions are not halted even when faced with great challenges and limited resources. The creativity and ingenuity of young people in developing innovative solutions must be acknowledged. It is clear that innovation will only become more relevant as our world moves forward. But youth-led innovation is not merely relevant. It is imperative if we are to recover better together from this pandemic. That is why on International Youth Day, I hope you will join me in celebrating the remarkable work and the perseverance of young people in delivering innovative solutions all around the world. This year, for the first time ever, my office is hosting a fully virtual Youth Lead Innovation Festival as a platform to celebrate and provide a space for young innovators, especially those from more vulnerable and marginalized communities. When we first launched the UN's youth strategy, Youth 2030, it was designed explicitly with the goal of allowing the UN to become a knowledge and innovation pioneer. And we know firsthand that we will not be able to do so without engaging with young people as equal partners in the process. In this spirit, I'm challenging us all to continue highlighting and elevating the leadership of young solution makers and to most importantly, continue meaningfully engaging youth in all of their diversity. To achieve the future we all want, we must ensure that no young person is left behind. Today and every day, I hope that you all take opportunities like this to share more about your work and how you have been making a positive impact in your community.
If there is one thing that I'm always confident about, it is the fact that our world is not short on ideas and solutions led by young people. And we want to hear what you have to say. I encourage all young people to join the conversation online using the hashtag YouthLead on social media and together let's show the world the magnitude of young people's power and potential. Thank you once again and happy International Youth Day. Wow, thank you so much for that. Uh, you have heard it's young people that we are the largest generation of change makers. So let us effect change as young people and strive to challenge the social and the gender norms that underpin FGM. We are not leaving anyone behind. So please tweet uh, the hashtags for the day is uh, youth and FGM, IYD 2021, and also uh, as you heard, youth lead. Thank you so much for that. Now, our second uh, guest speaker for the day is uh, Dr. Aziz Helenov, is the Deputy Representative, United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA Kenya Country Office. Uh, Dr. Aziz is from Turkmenistan and has been working with UNFPA since 1997. Before his joining to UNFPA Kenya team, he worked as the UNFPA Deputy Representative in Yemen, uh, UNFPA Regional Courage, yes, advisor, humanitarian focal point at uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia Regional Offices and the emergency coordinator in Sudan country office where he was responsible for UNFPA humanitarian program in Darfur. Karibu sana, sir. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Uh, the chief executive officer, Ante Jim Board, Madame Bernadette Loloju. Uh, young people present, the organizers of this event, all protocol observed. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, for me and for all our UNFPA team in Kenya, it's a pleasure to be with you today in this morning, be part of this webinar where we are talking about building back better from COVID-19, tackling female genital mutilation cutting with African youth as strategic partners as we commemorate the International Day of Youth 2021. Uh, we all know that pandemic has disproportionately affected the youth through disruption of every aspect of their lives, socially and economically. It is estimated by the United Nations that in addition, two million girls will be subjected to FGM in the next 10 years. One of the human rights violation of our time, which is a barrier for adolescent girls to attain their potential. As UNFPA, we believe that individuals have the right to make decisions about their bodies and future. Harmful practices such as FGM denies adolescents and girls such rights. But with the collective action around bodily autonomy, many young people are joining the movement in advocating against FGM. For societal change to be realized, especially on the abandonment of harmful practices, including FGM, the collective action must be driven by young people. If young people say that there will be no FGM in their generation, it will surely come to pass. Of course, we should also keep inter and intra-generational networking and collaboration at all levels in order to reach the mentioned change. Therefore, as UNFPA, we recognize young people as key stakeholders in building back better from COVID-19 as collaborators and agents of change. We continue to build their capacity and provide resources to support the engagement of youth-led civil society organizations and community-based organizations in the implementation of national commitments 
particularly those working on the implementation of the commitment on eliminating FGM in Kenya. We further continue to engage with young people on various platforms. And let me now brief uh, on the existing three platforms. First is UNFPA Youth Advisory Panel, a mechanism that allow, allows young people to contribute to the achievement of health outcomes on the uh, sustainable development goal number three. It is a platform for young people to participate in policy dialogue, advocacy, and implementation of programs within the country and ensure that UNFPA's programs are responsive to the needs of young people. It is comprised of 19, one of the nine, highly in, uh, motivated young volunteers from 16 UNFPA program counties. We are so happy as UNFPA team to see one of the YAP members, uh, Leshan Kerota, as a panelist in this webinar today. It's a great pleasure for us to know about it. And we will learn from him about UNFP Youth Advisor Panel more in detail. Second platform is Kenya Nimimi Initiative, a youth-led dialogue platform focused on promoting youth participation in social, economic, and leadership processes. It aims to bring young people together in collective action to explore youth-led solutions to challenges affecting them and to promote the mental and physical health and well-being of young persons across the 47 countries. It is a partnership between UNFPA and Minister of ICT, Innovation and Youth. And third platform is Youth Anti-FGM Network Kenya, YANC. UNFPA works closely with YANC, a youth-led network comprising of youth-led community-based organizations across the 22 FGM hotspot countries working towards to elimination of FGM in Kenya. UNFPA supported the establishment of county Yank chapters in three countries, and our goal is to have such kind of chapter in all 22 countries. The aim of supporting these country chapters is to enable young people advocate with the policymakers at the county level for risk allocation and other policy formulation and implementation of national commitments on end FGM by 2022. As we engage today, I reiterate UNFPA's commitment to working with young people to rely the national commitments uh, Kenya national commitments on ICPD 25. I thank you all, Asanteni Sana, and good luck with the fruitful webinar. I'm sure all our UNFPA team sure that this webinar will have great impact to our daily work. And I am feeling myself also part of uh, Kenyan young people, Kenyan young people team. Uh, and uh, uh, I wish you all the best, uh, and I will uh, look forward to hearing all of you in order to learn. Uh, are we in line with you, or we have some discrepancies in order to adjust our program for your needs? All the best. Thank you so much, Dr. Aziz. Uh, the young people will be telling us if we're in line or uh, what we need to do better uh, to support them as a strategic partner. Uh, UNFP has been very instrumental in supporting a youth-led movement here in Kenya uh, to end FGM. And um, thank you so much once again, sir, for that. Um, thank you, everybody who has joined us for this webinar this morning. Uh, keep tweeting. The um, hashtag is uh, hashtag NFGM, hashtag international IYD 2021. Uh, the third person I'd like to introduce to us this morning for uh, our opening remarks is uh, Madam Bernadette Loloju, she's the CEO and FGM 
Sport Kenya. She serves, uh, she has served in different capacities in the field of girls and women empowerment for more than 15 years. Being a survivor of FGM, she feels that um, she's, it is possible for every girl in the world to be safe so long as communities are fully engaged in the process of bringing uh, FGM to an end. Madam, welcome for your opening remarks. Madam Lolojo. good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much, um, Asenath, uh, Mithika. Um, um, good morning, everyone from very cold Nairobi. It's chilly this morning. Uh, this is um, Helen Ob, Deputy Representative UNFPA Kenya, my fellow uh, panelists uh, and all our participants, our young people. Uh, personally, I'm young at heart. The young people have told us we are young at heart. And I'm very happy this morning to join you in this webinar, uh, just to look at where we are in terms of engagement of young people. Uh, in the campaign to end FGM. As you've been told, my name is Bernadette Loloju. I'm the CEO of the Anti-FGM Board Kenya. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the government of Kenya. And this morning, I would want to say that the government of Kenya has made major strides uh, in the campaign to end FGM, child marriage and other harmful cultural practices, including uh, gender-based violence in all its forms. And um, one of the issues that we are looking at this morning is the policies and strategies and laws that have been put in place by this country. And what we can uh, uh, confidently say is that um, with the introduction of the um, uh, eradication of female genital mutilation act in 2011, then we had a very big shift in terms of the campaign to end FGM in Kenya. And one thing I can say is that that's one of the biggest things that has happened for the girls and women of this country. Because before that, it was not easy to really campaign and make sure that we reach out to our communities. But now with the law in place, we immediately got the anti-FGM board in place in 2014. And the anti-FGM board has come at the right time uh, when we just had devolution in 2013. And in the last seven years, we have seen a lot of work being done in the area of uh, elimination of FGM. One, we have the eradication of FGM policy that was launched by the president in State House Nairobi uh, in November 2019. And this policy we have started, uh, we started immediately to implement it. And one of the areas that we have focused on is empowerment of young people and working very closely with young people to make sure that we are able to reach um, the president's directive to end FGM by 2022. And I want to thank our partners who have really worked closely with us. We have the UNFPA UNICEF Joint Program. We have um, Equality Now. We have AMREF Health Africa. We have all the other organizations that have worked very closely with us to make sure that we reach um, the uh, area that we need to be in in the next uh, a few months, not even an year. We don't have an year to 2022. We also have the uh, Youth Anti-FGM Network, as uh, as this has said. And we've launched a number of chapters with our development partners. And we are hoping to have more chapters in the next few months through the support of our partners. So uh, what we are very proud of about the young people is the strength that they have and the move, uh, their movement. They have what it takes to really take us to where we need to get to go. Because what we are saying in this anti-FGM space is that the young people are the generation that will end FGM in their generation. And we are really seeing that happening. We already have a very good idea that came from one of our own, uh, Kereto, who started the university's engagement of university students. And uh, this idea, he started in February this year during International of Day of Zero Tolerance. And we were able to work with him and support him and had the first meeting it at Egerton University where we were able to engage more than 200 university students. And from there, we worked with him and we have agreed with him that going forward, we are going to make this engagement bigger and better. And through that, we were also able to bring in the Samburu University Students Association during the launch of the Samburu Young Chapter. And that one is one of the ways that we are planning to work with the university students by working with the uh, university organizations that are already set up. We've also worked very closely with the Korea University Students Association uh, in December uh, so that we, they could reach out to their younger sisters 
who are sometimes forced to go through FGM because of peer pressure. We saw that the young people are the only ones who are better placed to engage their fellow young people. So if you have a university student who comes from Puria or who comes from Marsabate or West Pokot or Garissa Mandera, they are better placed to go back home and engage their own younger sisters and younger brothers because they would listen to them more than they would listen to the older generation. And so that's an area that we are looking at and it's an area that we are focusing on strengthening going forward, making sure that we bring the university students and tertiary colleges students into this conversation so that they can be the people who will be change agents and champions will go back home and really uh, tell their people back home that FGM is not um, part of what they want to do in their generation. And for me, I believe that in the next uh, one or two years, Kenya will have made major strides uh, in this campaign and we will have moved forward to really bring down the statistics. At the moment, we have the presidential acceleration plan in place and we are working towards making sure that we accelerate ending FGM. I know we have had a very big challenge with the COVID-19 uh, because immediately we launched the policy in 2019. By March 2020, they, uh, we got a lock, we started having the lockdown and children had to stay at home from March 2020 to January 2021. That was one of the longest time of our lives. We never realized that children are safer at in school until when we had children at home for a whole uh, 10 months. Uh, it was a really big issue for us. And uh, at first we didn't know how to deal with it. We didn't know how to move out and really deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. But I'm happy that uh, we were able to move out and be able to, to do a bit of what we could do. But uh, we know that COVID really affected our efforts in the campaign to end FGM and child marriage. We also had a lot of teenage pregnancies during that period. Uh, but now this financial, uh, this year since uh, January, the calendar of the schools has really helped us. With the children in school now and only having a few breaks uh, has really helped us. And this is the time for the young people to really go around in schools and even talk to the young um, people in schools and really make them uh, become our champions. So I want to thank every one of you who has joined us in this. We want you to be our champions. We want you to go out there and become the voice because ending FGM is everyone's responsibility. And I believe this is the generation that will end it once and for all. Thank you very much and have a very wonderful International Youth Day. Youth Day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam uh, Bernadette Lolojo. There you had it that uh, Young people in Kenya are already being engaged as strategic partners uh, through the student associations uh, as change agents to go back and um, sensitize their community members. Have you tweeted? If you have not, there are a couple of tweets that uh, there are a couple of comments that uh, our speakers have been making. And please uh, let's keep the conversation live also on Twitter. Young people are indeed the generation to end FGM. That's a tweet. Uh, if young people say no to FGM, then uh, the practice will surely come to an end. That's another tweet. Uh, so let us keep tweeting, let's keep engaging. And if you have any questions or comments, please drop them at the chat box. Now, I'm sure you're wondering how is this theme uh, related to the Global uh, International Youth Day theme? The Global International Day Youth Theme is uh, the the Global International Youth System, rather, is transforming food systems, youth innovations for human and uh, planetary health. And to help us uh, tie this together with our youth, uh, with a uh, um, theme for today, rather, is uh, Madame Donna Ayona. She's the technical lead, gender and advocacy at AMREF Health Africa. AMREF Health Africa have uh, conducted two researches, one on evidence on the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on FGM and child marriage in Kenya, and also the intersection between climate change and FGM among the Maasai of uh, Kajiado. Madam Donna Anyona, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Asana, and uh, all protocols observed. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to present to you these two studies, and I'll request that they be yes projected. Um, and Madame Lolodu has kind of uh, talked about some even of the findings that have happened.
but now I'll present on exactly what we found. So these are the two studies. One is on effects of COVID-19 pandemic on, on FGM. See, and the, and the second one is the intersection between climate change and female genital mutilation. So next, please. Um, so for the first study, um, what we were trying to look at uh, was the impact of COVID-19 on ending FGM and the far-reaching effects it ha it's had on uh, female genital mutilation and child early and post marriages. If you look at the two uh, open sources, we see um, what uh, some of the issues that arose. For instance, the first one, Kenya efforts to end FGM suffer blow with victims paraded in open fans. So these are some of the issues that led us to really uh, conduct this study. We know that over 2 billion FGM cases could occur over the next decades. And these are cases that would otherwise be averted. And also will result in an additional total 13 million child marriages taking place that otherwise would be averted by between 2020 and 2030. So what we've been trying to do is generate evidence around this impact and provide data that is going to inform responsive interventions and preparedness uh, in the future. Um, next. So, so what were our findings and results? First of all, we, the study uh, was conducted in four countries, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Senegal. And the study focused on the youth. In Kenya and Ethiopia, we focused on ages 26 to 35, and Uganda and Senegal was uh, 15 to 18 years. So some of the effects and what came arose for instance, in Kenya, is that COVID-19 pandemic contributed to the increase in both FGMC and early marriages and forced marriages. In Uganda, we saw an increase of FGMC from five to seven percent, uh, and an, and and for child early and forced marriages, there was an increase of 14 to 69 percent. So that was pretty high. In the, in Ethiopia, on the other hand. Uh, we realized that there were issues whereby the findings contradicted the results from the policymakers and programming implementers. And we believed that there was an increase of cases of um, child early forced marriages due to the closure of schools. But then uh, we were very uncertain about the changes of FGMC cases. In Senegal, there were minimum effects of COVID-19 on the number of the cases. So generally, the pandemic had negative and continues to have neg uh, negative effects on implementation and intervention, and especially by the justice and legal system, the health system, as well as civil society organizations. So again, this was a mixed method study. We used both qualitative and quantitative data to help us collect this data. Um, next, please. So these are some of the barriers that we saw uh, while collecting the data. And the main, I'll, I'll focus on the three main ones. One was in inadequacy of reporting by the victims. And remember, this was done um, during uh, some, where some of the countries had lockdown. So there was inadequacy in reporting by the victims. Uh, there was also um, challenges of accessing victims due to the restrictions. So it was very hard for us to access these victims but also um, fear of lack of services being offered. So those stood out uh, quite a bit in all these uh, countries. And then, um, next please. Yeah, so what kind of approaches uh, then were used to support women and girls? This varied in all the countries because again, it depended with uh, the restrictions in all the different countries, the countries that had curfew. And for those that had curfews, the radio talk shows really uh, were up. For instance, Uganda, and this was collected, especially when there was um, all this, uh, the, the curfews and the restrictions. That's why Uganda, I see the radio talk shows were a bit high. When you come to Kenya, for instance, um, again, the radio talk shows, the dialogue forums were very, very effective but also using champions as part of risk communication. Then Ethiopia, 
there was use of call centers, which uh, really stood out, as well as using local champions as well. For Senegal, uh, local call centers uh, topped the list, as well as radio talk shows. Uh, so this is this the approaches um, were different based on different contexts and circumstances that uh, each country was facing during the pandemic. Uh, next, yeah. So in summary, um, in Kenya, we realized that the pandemic had significantly contributed to the increase of both FGMC and uh, child early and forced marriages cases. There was, and this was as, as a result of closure of schools. Schools were closed for a long time. There was economic losses and people staying at home, including potential victims. So that really contributed. While in Uganda, there was minimum increase of FGM cases and a significant increase in the early, uh, child early and forced marriages cases. Here, we note that the data collection happened before the season of FGMC. So again, and that was in December. So again, that was a factor. While in Ethiopia and Senegal, the pandemic had a minimal effect on the changes. And here, the challenges exist on reporting FGMC and the child early and forced marriages cases. So the efforts to end FGM and uh, Charlie, child early and forced marriages have been negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, as we've seen from the summary. And this has an, had an effect on the legal system, on the health system, as well as civil society organizations, because structures had already been put in place, but then the pandemic happened and it almost negated most of the things that we had done. So there is need uh, for innovative approaches um, to help uh, end FGMC and CEFM during the pandemic. So next, please. So the next uh, study is the second one, and this one was conducted in one of the counties in Kenya, Kajiado. And this talks about the intersection between climate change and female genital mutilation amongst the Maasai in Kajiado. Next, please. So if you look at the picture on the right, uh, this is Lake Magadi, and as you can see, it's dried up. And below it, these are residents who are queuing for water, very long queues looking for water. And then, so what then does it have? What effect that does it have on uh, FGMC? So the, what the argument was that is that climate change is contributing to changes in the practice of FGM among this community. And the community there predominantly is Maasai. And this is as a result of increased gender inequalities and strained livelihoods due to the social economic decline, which has a direct impact on women and girls. So the objective of this study was therefore to, uh, to look at the effect of climate change on the social change and look at the gender norms as well as FGM, uh, C, FGMC practice. Next. So the next picture, Again, you can see uh, down there, it's mostly girls who have the jerry cans and they're queuing for water. So some of the findings that uh, then we found in this study is that um, we realized that the climate change eroded the Maasai social and economic fabric. And this is in particular dwindling their livelihoods. And their mainstay is, has been livestock, we all know. and so. What this does is that now the focus has shifted to something else. And while the changes have resulted in widening of gender inequalities and further disempowerment of women and girls through the loss of education, then perpetuation of FGM and increase of child marriages uh, comes out along. So what, are the what were the direct impacts on girls and women while we were conducting this study? There was the dwindling, dwindling livelihoods, which led to more poverty. And of course, now it's, it becomes like a cycle of poverty, which continues. Climate-induced migration, because uh, the community have to move now to where they can find better livelihoods, uh, therefore uprooting their social fabric. Increased gender inequalities. As you can see, 
girls here are not going to school. They're going to queue to fight, to fetch for water, to look for water. And then again, girls school dropouts so that they can support in, in fetching water and finding food. And again, perpetuation of FGMC and child marriages continue because then they lack the education and um, their social fabric is generally disturbed. Um, next. So the conclusion and recommendation, we realized that um, um, the, there was a broader social ecological factor that posed as barrier to social and gender norms, and especially amongst the Maasai of Kajiado. If you look at the, 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 the chart up there um, and how the effect on social norms and gender norms has been affected, at the structural level, you see these, you know, national laws and local people advocacy and you know political and economic access to resources um, is affected at the individual level we have you know there's all these factual beliefs these um, attitudes and self you know efficacy uh, that needs uh, to be looked at um, at the social level we look at the community norms uh, and local power dynamics. We look at, you know, the axis of gender, age, ethnicity, and more um, has been affected. And generally, it has an effect at the global level on climate change. And therefore, the question is, how, how best do we address this? How do we bring the intersection between gender and uh, addressing the climate change situation? So there's a need to adopt a multi-level intersectional approach when designing programs, and as well as you know have um, contextual, social, economic, and environmental factors that should not be overlooked when tailoring FGM intervention and programs. Thank you very much. That was the those were some of the conclusions and uh, what the, the two studies uh, presented uh, in AMREF and. I must uh, acknowledge that these studies were led by Dr. Tamari Esho. I think she's in this meeting, yes, of AMREF Health Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Donna Anyona, for unpacking how the pandemic has affected efforts on ending FGM and how climate change is becoming a driver on FGM and child marriage due to gender inequalities and the spring uh, a livelihood. Uh, maybe you should just introduce Dr. Tamari Esho, is the director of um, NFMC Center for Excellence at AMREF Health Africa. She's a public, public health scientist and sexual medicine consultant with specific expertise in generating evidence through research, capacity building, planning and implement, in implementing interventions in both family, community, and health systems levels against FGM, STDV, child marriage, among others in a bid to promote public health. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari, for that and uh, Donna. So then, uh, how do we then uh, build back better as um, to deal with the pandemic and how do we have young people as a strategic partner? And to lead us to that session, I would like to hand over to my colleague and my co-moderator, Ismail, the head of policy and advocacy at AMREF Health Africa to lead the next session. Thank you so much. Over to you, Ismail. Yeah, hello everyone. So it's really exciting to uh, have had that have had that presentation and uh, listening to all panelists. And also, I'm excited to see very many young people and uh, uh, development partners, policymakers, researchers joining uh, this quite uh, you know uh, important forum. So um, now we want to listen to the voices of young people. Yeah, we've heard what the adult partners are, uh, are doing and, their pl and the plans that they have for us. Now it's time to listen to what young people have to say. It's time to listen to survivors, um, you know, young women who have undergone through FGMC and just get to hear their experiences and, and how they're leading 
uh, the end of chair movement in their countries. So to start us off, uh, we have Leshan Kereto, who is a member of the UNFPA Youth Advisory Panel. And uh, just recently he has been installed as the president of the International Federation of Physician Assistant, Physician Associate and Clinical Officer, Clinical Associate uh, Comparable Students Association. It's called IFPACS and it's a long title. And he also serves as the founder and director of Tareto Africa. So Leshan Kiritu, uh, our question, or rather the question that is directed to you is uh, with regards to the topic, putting youth in the driving seat of change. Why youth voices and ideas are important for achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Please go ahead, Leshan. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the question. I'm very much excited today to be here, as well as about a very big day tomorrow. And so I think putting youth on uh, the steering wheel on uh, uh, fighting FGM, one, is because first of all, what is happening is happening to the youth. FGM is happening directly to girls who are of our generation. Uh, girls who are going to be our, our, our wives, are going to be our girlfriends, our sisters, our colleagues. And so putting us in on the front wheel is going to enable us to decide on what we want to come into a generation. We are involved in making a, a, a fabric that is going to prevent us from having so many problems and so many issues that are going to affect our generation. So we are the designers, we are the custodians of what culture is going to be happening to our generation. And so I think putting us on the forefront, first of all, comes in to utilize what we have as a young people. One, uh, as a young person, you have time. You have time to do a lot of stuff. You have time to uh, engage in social media. You have time to uh, uh, fight for what you want to fight for. And that is what exactly time comes in with. Second, you have the creativity. You know, at youthfulness, you are at the top of, uh, you are at the, top of, of the graph. You are the one who has the minds, the creativity. You have the innovation and the technology to bring on board ideas that can really transform uh, this advocacy. The last one is now about the energy. And the energy is really what really the young people are identified with. So the moment you're putting them there, you're bringing in um, their time, which of which they have to really contribute towards this. You're also bringing in uh, their creativity and mindsets into knowing what side we are as a generation what's fighting FGM. And that now bringing into their energy to harness it, to bring in on board what exactly we want in terms of fighting FGM. And so I think putting them on the forefront is actually what needs to be done for even for the sustainability of what we've been planning to do. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Leshan Kareto, for that insightful um, you know, remarks. And uh, now we, we, we also need to understand that FGM does not only happen in Kenya. This is a, a, a phenomenon that happens across uh, multiple countries. And so we, the next uh, speaker uh, that I'm going to invite, uh, her name is uh, Diaka Salena Koroma, who is the founder and uh, director of Girls Empowered from Sierra Leone. And her question is, um, or rather, uh, you need to uh, let us know more about this topic. Putting girls at the center of the COVID-19 pandemic response in Africa. Yeah, maybe you can let sh shed some light on how, how COVID-19 has been able to impact, uh, especially, you know, girls uh, and young women in Sierra Leone. Please go ahead, Diego. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you again for having me on this platform. It's truly a pleasure. And um, we talk about young people being creative and being the change, being the drivers of change. So I decided to put a bit of twist on my speech this morning when I talk on how we can put girls at the center of um, COVID-19 response in Sierra Leone. Um, my name, Diata Salina Koma, is not my um, maternal name. I was born Diata Shek Fufana. I'm carrying the, my mom's maiden name. And I am a girl. I am still a girl. Being even at the age of 30, I still consider myself as a girl. These days, I've got to understand that it is the girl in me that is striving to lead, not the woman in me. 
It is the girl in me who is trying to survive in a society where decisions are made on behalf of me, and I am not put in those decisions making processes. The woman in me can only leave when that little girl is put in the center of everything that surrounds her well-being and survival. So you see, being a girl, before I was even of thought to be conceived by my mama and papa, my society had a set path for me to walk through in order to be accepted as a human. Here on this earth, where no human being is created without living in my heart's womb, for 276.75 days, or sometimes even longer. I am a girl, I am a girl too. And I want to tell you not the story of the 14,000 girls who got pregnant after the Ebola pandemic in Sierra Leone. And these girls were also banned from attending school by the present government then, who is also the past government now. I am a girl, I am a girl too. And I want to tell you not the story of the 21.8% of girls who went through FGM, see, at ages under five or even at infancy, here in Sierra Leone. I am a girl, I am a girl too. And I want to tell you not the story of the 86.9% of girls who went through FGM, Stroxy below the ages of 18 here in my beloved county. I am a girl, I am a girl too, but I am seen as a broker. I am labeled as a broker, which means I am an unclean, undecent, infertile, and, um, empowered woman because I did not go through FG. My society has let me down as a girl in many ways, starting from my home, my school, my safe spaces. My first encounter when I was first sexually penetrated on was when I was at the age of seven and it was by my cousin in my mom's house. My virginity, sorry, let me be a girl now. I was deflowered by my principal in my school when I was in junior secondary school. That was around the ages, my, I was around the age of 17. So you see, my pains and my fight to speak up and understand that my silence serves no one is the fact that my government, my family, and my loved ones, they let me down as a girl. My government put in place policies that are to protect the girl child. But yet again, after the Ebola pandemic, we had 14,000 girls who got pregnant. And the decision that the government took was to ban these girls not to go to school. And even when they decided that, okay, I've given birth, I want to go to school, they were set with too many barriers and challenges how my government put me, put me first as a girl was when the current sitting government came into power and they decided that no girl, no girl should be left behind when they offer free and quality education. So they lifted the ban, which banned, um, which restricted um, pregnant girls from going to school. How international organizations um, did not let me get down as a girl was when I attended the first Pan-African Youth Summit in Kenya in 2018 that was organized by the Girl Generation and UNFP and their partners. When I came back to Sierra Leone, I set up with, in partnership with UNFP as a girl, they capacitated me to be able to set up the youth-led movement, the first youth-led movement in Sierra Leone that galvanize the voices of young people to come together and discuss issues that are affecting How civil society organizations also are empowering girls through my leadership as a founder or as a you know, mentor. Last year when the COVID-19 hit, we decided that 
we need to empower girls through vocational and life skills. So we relaunched our life skills um, project, which um, gave girls a safe space to come together and do different skills that will engage them during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because we understood that Sierra Leone, when you talk about lockdown, we have gone through that. Over a year, we went through um, Ebola for like three years and we understood how devastating the results and the impact was. Also last year, as a girl, we lost a five-year-old girl who was sexually penetrated on and also strangled to death, Kadija Sako. We came out as young people to make sure that we speak up because again, we understand that our silence serves no one. We came together and made sure that we spoke up to protect young people. I am calling the government, young people and partners to come together to understand that the silence serves no one. Speak up and take action to end FGM and all forms of violence against women and girls. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diak. I think that was a really moving, um, uh, moving remarks from you. And, and of course, thank you so much for, for sharing your personal story. Uh, it really means so much to, to everyone who is listening to you. And thank you for the boldness and the courage. And of course, uh, as, as part of our safeguarding strategy, we will ensure that we have a post uh, webinar session for panelists and uh, probably speakers uh, for this forum. So um, we'll go to the next speaker now from Sierra Leone. Let's move all the way to the neighboring country, uh, Senegal. So from Senegal, we have Nathaniel Louis Agustin Tete, who is a um, you know, scout commissioner and assistant trainer, uh, president of the National Youth Committee. And uh, so um, Nathaniel, welcome and uh, kindly feel free to discuss uh, about the topic on African youth have the power to break the cycle of FGMC. And you can provide lessons from Senegal. Also feel free to take it away the way you feel fit. Welcome, Nathaniel. And uh, Rachel uh, Eskin from Amrefeld Africa will be doing the translation from, uh, of course, okay. French to English. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Nathaniel. I think everyone uh, hear me well. We can hear you. We can hear you, Nathaniel. Good. So, you uh, are from Sorry, 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 Nathaniel. Sorry, Nathaniel. We can't hear you properly. Uh, uh, maybe we give you some time to check on the on your on your microphone, and then we will we will have you back. Good. Rachel, can you able to hear to hear him? No, oh, no, no. I'm having the same problem. All right. So, Nathaniel, maybe you try fixing your uh, microphone, and then we will get back to you after the next speaker. So, the next speaker comes from Ethiopia, uh, and her name is Hewot Girma. Hewot is a member of uh, the AMREF uh, Youth Advisory Group, and uh, um, I would I would ask uh, Nathaniel to mute your microphone, please. So Hiwot Girma is a member um, of the AMREF Youth Advisory Group, and she will be speaking about building back better for African youth, why we must be seen as strategic partners. And feel to take the topic away and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, my name is Hiwot. I'm from Ethiopia. Thank you, Smile, for that uh, brief introduction. Well, uh, let me say something about this. Uh, why we must be seen as strategic partners in order to end female genital uh, mutilation uh, as soon as possible. So uh, it is a must to work with youth as one of the strategic partners because global youth population swells up to record 1.8 billion as per statistics. Uh, so youth has also higher years of education, higher access to the internet and greater possibilities of physical mobility. And we all know female genital mutilation is a global issue affecting at least 200 million girls and women in at least 30 countries in Africa, the Middle East, and also Asia. 
So young people are in strong position to end female genital mutilation and, and their generation by encouraging their age mates, families, community members, and leaders to do the same. And also, it is also very necessary to foster the empowerment of youth and uh, ensure a safe space in order to openly discuss and tackle such uh, complex issues like this. And also, it's very important to, to be able to learn from youth. Uh, people's experiences is also essential for uh, creating effective policies and systems to better engage FGM affected <laughs> youth and communities. And also because nobody can give better youth uh, views than the youth themselves. So that's very important. And also young people can act as uh, cultural mediators and encourage intergenerational dialogue. Uh, and also young people are vital for confronting and communicating existing issues in the most uh, appropriate, <laughs> appropriate manner to older uh, family members. So this can be considered uh, one of the most effective ways to change attitudes uh, towards female genital mutilation over time. And also um, as a country label, uh, there's a national posted roadmap uh, to end female genital mutilation and end uh, child marriage. Uh, it was developed by the Ethiopian government in 2019. So we should find ways to meaningfully engage ourselves uh, accordingly. And I believe young people have the power, uh, the energy, uh, the, the, like they can bring the real change to their societies that they're living. So uh, they deserve to be listened. So this is my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Hewitt, uh, Kirma, for, for reminding us that young, young people uh, should be uh, cultural mediators, and that way we will be in a position to promote intergenerational dialogue, uh, of course, with our partners and with other community members. So thank you so much for your insight. So the next speaker that I'm going to introduce, uh, uh, her name is Umu Salif Ture. So Umu Salif Ture, uh, she's from Mali. And uh, she will also be sharing her experience with regards to you know, ending FGMC and child marriage. And uh, welcome, welcome, uh, Umi. And uh, I hope Rachel will be able to uh, translate for her as well. Welcome, Umu. Uh, thank you, Ismail. Can you hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you. Uh, yeah, I would advise anybody who is not speaking to just mute their so that we can move forward. Please go ahead, Umu. Thank you, so Ismail. Uh, sorry, my English is not perfect. I will speak in French and someone will translate for everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm happy to be here uh, today. Uh, je m'appelle Umu, Umu Touré de the Global Media Campaign to NFGM. Uh, les violences uh, faites aux femmes et aux filles constituent uh, une des violations des droits de la personne les plus répandues. Les Nations uh, Unies estiment qu'une femme, les Nations Unies estiment qu'une femme sur trois dans le monde ont subi des violences physiques ou des violences sexuelles simplement parce que ce sont des femmes. La violence est vraiment un obstacle majeur pour le développement des femmes et des filles. Et, uh, et ainsi aussi qu'au qu bien-être et au développement de leur communauté et des sociétés dans leur ensemble. Les mutilations génitales féminines désignent toutes les interventions aboutissant à l'ablation partielle ou totale des organes génitaux externes de la fille ou de la femme ou toute autre mutilation des organes génitaux féminines pratiquée pour des raisons non médicales. Uh, bien que constituant... Excuse-moi, pardon. On va juste s'arrêter là et je vais traduire ce que tu, tu viens de dire. Et on ok, ok, à la sorry. Partie. Non, non, il n'y a pas de quoi. C'est bon Je peux Oui, vas-y. Yeah. Ok, thanks. So, uh, she says, hello, uh, my name is Umu Touré from the Global Media Campaign to End FGMC in Mali. Violence against women and girls constitutes one of the most common violations of human rights. The United Nations estimates that worldwide, one in three women has experienced physical or sexual violence just because she is a woman. Violence <laughs> is a major obstacle to the development of women and girls, as well as to the well-being of their communities, 
and societies as a whole. FGMC refers to any intervention involving the partial or total removal of a woman's external uh, genital organs or any other mutilation of a woman's genital organs for non-medical reasons. Merci. Alors, bien que constituant des violations des droits humains reconnus à l'échelle internationale, les mutilations génitales féminines ont été pratiquées sur plus de 200 millions des filles et des femmes en vie aujourd'hui. Dans certaines communautés au Mali, elles sont vues comme un moyen d'asservir la sexualité des filles ou une garantie de chasteté. Dans d'autres, elles constituent un prérequis au mariage. Elle est souvent considérée comme un rite de passage pour les filles. Les mutilations génitales féminines ne sont pas approuvées par l'islam ou le christianisme. Mais les croyances liées à la religion sont fréquemment invoquées pour justifier à la pratique au Mali. Je, je vais très bien. So, um, Mou says, although FGMC has been recognized as a violation of human rights on an international level, more than 200, 200 million women and girls who are alive today have been subjected to the practice. In some communities in Mali, FGMC is seen as a way to rein in or control women's sexuality or as a guarantee of chastity. In others, FGMC constitutes a prerequisite to marriage and a rite of passage for girls. FGMC is not authorized by Islam or Christianity, but religious beliefs are often invoked to justify the practice. Hello, um, a GMC, uh, on se bat pour qu'on parce qu'on sait que nous, nous pouvons changer les, les croyances néfastes qui sont au cœur de ces problèmes. C'est ce qui a été appris, peut-être désappris. Il est temps pour nous tous et toutes, les femmes, hommes, filles et garçons, mais aussi les acteurs publics, de, de mettre fin ensemble aux violences faites aux femmes et aux filles. Ah, juste pour, pour finir, ah, je suis personnellement une victime des mutilations génitales féminines. Et à la base, tu... Tu, tu te dis pas que ça pourrait avoir des conséquences dévastatrices sur ta vie jusqu'à ce que tu te maries, jusqu'à ce que tu veuilles faire un enfant ou jusqu'à ce que tu vois des femmes qui sont plus épanouies que toi. Et l'objectif de ma lutte, ce n'est pas vraiment de me protéger moi parce que c'est déjà fait, il n'y a plus rien à refaire, mais de protéger mes filles et les, les autres filles pour pas qu'elles subissent les, les mêmes problèmes que moi j'ai eu. Et j'ai eu et c'est pourquoi je me bats et c'est pourquoi je continue à lutter pour que la prochaine génération soit une génération épargnée. Merci, Oumou. Oh, pardon. Je, je vais traduire cette partie-là et après tu continues si tu veux. Um, so, Oumou says, at the global media campaign to end FGMC, we continue to fight because we know that the harmful beliefs that are at the heart of the practice and the problem can be changed. What has been learned can be unlearned. It's time for us, all of us, women and men, girls and boys, but also public bodies and actors to work together to put an end to violence against women and girls. Um, and she went on to share her own personal experience. Um, Umu says, I'm a survivor myself of FGMC and I never thought um, it could have such devastating consequences. Um, it's something you don't realize until you are older and you maybe get married or, or have children yourself. Um, she said the reason she fights is not for her, but for her daughters and the other girls and for the generation and that is coming after hers. Um, she wants all girls and young women to be able to live life to the full. Merci Rachel. Alors, euh, juste pour finir, je sais que les, les mutilations génitales féminines sont ancrées dans la société malienne, dans la tradition, dans les faits et gestes de toujours. Et, on, et nous, on essaye de démystifier tant qu'on peut dans un contexte très, très hostile. On fait face aux leaders religieux qui sont toujours là pour, pour te décourager, qui sont toujours là pour te dire que c'est la religion. Mais on sait que ça n'a rien à voir avec la religion. Du coup, on s'arme de beaucoup de courage et beaucoup d'espoir. Nous allons à la radio, à la télé, sur les terrains. Nous sensibilisons pour que la population puisse comprendre. Parce que les mutilations génitales féminines 
c'est avant tout un problème de santé publique qui touche les jeunes. Alors, pour cette journée internationale à de jeunes, j'aimerais juste attirer l'attention des dirigeants à, à, en Afrique, particulièrement des dirigeants de mon pays, sur cette question qui est de plus en plus cruciale et qu'il faut mettre au centre de nos à plaidoyer au niveau pays. Merci à tout le monde et désolé pour, pour, pour les Français. Non, mais alors, tu t'excuses pas du tout. <rire> Merci beaucoup. Je vais traduire ce que tu viens de dire et après, tu me diras si c'est juste. Et si j'ai raté mm. quelque chose, tu me dis. OK. Merci. Um, <coughs> so, um, Moussa says that in Mali, they're working in a tricky context. Um, they're really working to sort of demystify Um, the beliefs around FGMC that, that mean it, it continues um, and they're working in particular with religious leaders um, who are trying to sort of maintain the status quo and that's particularly difficult. Um, so um, she says that um, she and her fellow activists have a lot of courage and also a lot of hope. They go on TV, they go on the radio to raise uh, awareness and really challenge those beliefs um, that are so anchored in Malian society. And um, she says, FGMC is above all else a public health problem. Um, and what she wants to do today is, um, it, as a young person and, and in honor of International Youth Day is really just raise awareness um, among decision makers um, in Mali and um, across the continent um, of FGMC and, and, and tell the stories of those who are working to end it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, uh, thank you for, for your sharing your story, and it's very powerful to hear from you know survivors, um, you know young women who have undergone FGMC. Uh, it's very difficult for you to talk about FGMC, and it's also something else for you to have undergone the uh, you know the through the practice. So we we appreciate for the boldness and the courage. And uh, we, we are here to support you and to cheer, to cheer you on with your work on working with young girls uh, in, uh, in Mali. So thank you also, Rachel, for that, uh, you know. Thank you, uh, clear, <laughs> thank you Rachel, also for the clear, uh, you know, translation. So, so we move uh, to, I think we, we, we come back to East Africa before we go back to, back to West Africa. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Marian Daher. So Dr. Mariam Daher comes from a country where the FGM prevalence is at 99.1%. She comes from Somaliland. She's the chairperson of Youth Anti-FGM Somaliland. And she will be speaking to us on the topic of ending FGMC, a survivor's perspective. So this will be a conversation with Dr. Mariam uh, Daher, who is an FGMC survivor and an activist leading the end of GM movement in Somaliland. Welcome Mariam, Dr. Mariam. This is mine and everybody, and there is a background noise because of that and the call for prayer is so if that is not disturbing, I can continue. Is that okay? I I think we can we can we can hear you. Can you. Hear me. Okay, yes. fine. Fantastic. Um, happy International Youth Day, everybody, and I'm thanking everybody who came on board and give his uh, or her testimony and I, I was inspired whenever I am in this kind of meetings I get inspired especially the um, other survivors who are actually coming on board openly and speaking about FGM. Coming to my um, personal story about FG, FGM, I joined the FGM campaigns in when I graduated from the medical school because I have seen the pain of women who were coming to the delivery room. When they were uh, having uh, babies, they were, there is a lot of cuts and we were doing a lot of episiotomy, then suturing again, and some of them were developing fistula. So I actually came out because of that pain. I couldn't and beat it. So um, in 2012, when I started the FGM campaigns, it was a taboo and many people walk away. And even my family was ashamed from me because I was speaking from my thing, what they call, that's your thing. You can't talk about it. It is a shame. It is, a, it is an FGM 
and it is from the tradi our tradition we inherited from a, a generation to generation so nobody can speak about it it is a, something called halal halalain in somali community so when i started my campaign it was coming strong and stronger because i couldn't i did not stop it and i was speaking behalf from the medical perspective and at, at least that was a, something that people can say oh it has a complications but unfortunately in somaliland we don't have a law still um fgn is not yet criminalized and as well as we don't have any um policies clear policies international NGOs and unfp as well as the other un agencies are actually working hard to advocate against fgm and as well as awareness raising um, we uh, formed a youth and tfgm somaliland in 2018 after we um participated the meeting in april with the girl generation and other partners in kenya and that kind of a movement started from a young um, people who actually came on board we were five women and four boys and even the boys were not very confident to come on board and talk about it and we really needed a main voice here because we know fgm in somaliland we we do it for a man to be a woman to be a woman they can be married we give money dowry, dowry and a lot of that so 50 percent of the driving force of fgm is the, to please a man a man is in our community so we really needed a man's voice and still it's lagging behind but actually we had a in youth and fgm we had a good um, group of men who came on board so we use social media. Uh, we go to on campus uh, as university and students. We do campaigns, and as well, we formed many for forums in the regions of Somaliland. Um, one of the things actually we are working hard this time is the, to get the legislation. So we are the one who actually um, collected petitions from all the young generation and young people from the regions. And now we have up to 4,000 voices that against FGM in the child generation and youth from the youth. So actually youth is changing agent if we give them the steering wheel. Youth are the one who actually have the energy and actually those who are touched by the pain and actually got the education because our older generation doesn't got whatever we had now. We are having access of education as well as the information and awareness raising and all of that. So actually um, what we have in the country now, a good um, voice, strong voice uh, from the youth who actually against FGM, but we really need a lot of work and especially to establish strategies and as well as to push that the parliament and our government to work together with us and to pass the law so and if we if i go back to the survivor uh, side in somaliland as you said smile and uh, 99.1 actually uh, it, it seems that every woman in somaliland had fgm any kind of fgm any type now they started types type three sunnah all of these kind of things but it's a cut at the end of the day but nobody's speaking about it because nobody no i think we have a few women who actually spoke about it especially in diaspora and as a survivor and they shared their pain but in country women are silenced because of they can't speak about it at all. So that is again another challenge I'm facing and as well as the other activities are facing is that the women are silent and they don't have any um, decision on their voice as well as their um, their um, willing to share their pain. And we don't have a counseling centers, we don't have FGM and counseling areas or complication management um unities so this is the things that actually we have in our country and i see a hope at the tunnel at the end of the tunnel because of the youth actually uh, moving ahead and we have 4000 
voices against FGM in Somalia and that we collected by youth and FGM. Thank you, Smar. Thank you so much, Mariam, for again, your, your sharing your experience and your story. And, and of course, thank you for leading the movement to end FGMC in Somaliland. I know it's a very, very tough terrain, knowing that, uh, uh, you know, they use religion as, as, as a means to why FGM continues to happen. So thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, at some point we will be able to slowly uh, reduce the impact of FGMC uh, especially on girls and, and women in, in Somalia. So thanks in Somaliland, thank you so much. Now, uh, I think Nathaniel, we'll go to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, is your, uh, do you want to go now? Um, can, we hear, can we hear if your voice is okay? Yes. Oh, please go ahead, Nathaniel. It's okay now? Yes, Okay, yes, it's, it's more clear now? Good, I will be, uh, I will go fast and, um, uh, what? Yes, please go ahead and Rachel can Rachel, you bon? in a Oui, ça coupe encore un petit peu, mais c'est bon. Et, okay. Vas-y, essaye. C'est mieux. C'est mieux, mais c'est, c'est un peu lent encore. Okay, go ahead. Vas-y, vas-y, essaye, et on va voir comment ça se passe. Okay, it, it will be good. Let, let's be, it will be, uh, it will be good. Let's be optimistic. Okay, okay. So, um, uh, int as an introduction, I would like to say that uh, social emergencies uh, uh, in development issues uh, are today uh, um, uh, uh, is in the world cannot find viable solutions. So especially uh, since we are in the digital age and in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the uh, World uh, Health Organization, FDM includes all procedures resulting in partial or total removal of a woman, woman's genitalia and or any other injury to the female genital organs performs for non therapical purpose. So despite the existence of the law against FGM, in some area, <clears throat> notably in the south of the country, like Kolda and uh, Seju and Velingara, in the region of Chess, uh, where I am right now, more precisely in Moor, uh, a department in the region of, of uh, Chess, and in the northwest, northern region, Matam, Podor, some ethnic groups still practice the FGM. Uh, as an element of uh, context, uh, you can go uh, next to the next slide. So uh, the adoption of the law uh, in Senegal on January, uh, in 1999, uh, existence of the national strategy to promote the, the abandonment of the FGM, the existence of a national child welfare strategy, uh, the joint program of UNICEF and uh, UNFPA to combat the female genital mutil uh, mutilation and cutting, the commitment uh, of uh, the social civil uh, organization like AMREF, uh, uh, TOSTAN, and the, the youth network for the promotion of the, of the abandonment of uh, FGM, the development and implementation of various action plans, uh, the military sectorial approach with the ministry is concerned. And Senegal uh, is the third African country to adopt the legislation of female genital mutilation. So you, you can go ahead. Some statistics, you can, it's okay, Don't, in Senegal, 25% of women's age between uh, 15 to 49 years report having been cut and the prevalence of FGM varies by ethnicities. According to UNICEF, while the exact number of girls and women who have undergone FGM remains unknown, <clears throat> it is estimated to be at least uh, 2,000 million, 200 million 
in certain country in Africa, the Middle East and Asia, where there's where these practices are concentrated. In Africa, nearly three million girls are at risk of FGM each year since UNICEF uh, 2016. Senegal is among the countries with a high prevalence of female genital mutilation. Uh, 14 of percent of girls aged 0 to 14 report having been cut according to the 2000 uh, in, uh, 27 uh, demonstrate demographic and health survey, survey, a figure that has not improved significantly in recent years. Despite Senegal national and international commitment to criminalize, criminalize female genital mutilation in 2010, the country found that the law was poorly uh, uh, enforced. So like uh, AMBREF and uh, uh, the NGO of uh, Fisher Dig, they are uh, they have done some projects uh, to tackle this challenge, uh, like Girl Choice Future and the project Devonir. Uh, you can go ahead, uh, who is uh, coordinated by Ambref Senegal. And uh, there is another, uh, their strategy uh, is to develop uh, the uh, development of uh, a package of integrated activities in four in four sphere of uh, uh, community schools health service and advocacy training and networking of champions for the fight against fgm organization of health genitals to equip uh, a capacity state high school school uh, students in the field of uh, uh, health and fgm in seju region uh, ECLA, their strategy, uh, uh, research, sensitization, and advocacy, monitoring, and alert, community mobilization, literacy, reintegration, psychological follow up, income generating activities. And how the youth, uh, you can go ahead, uh, how the youth uh, participate in the project. <clears throat> so, and, uh, uh, Okay, you can go ahead. Okay, Base, baseline studies, the youth participate at this level, observation, low involvement. Uh, the observation is the low involvement of the young people, absence of community dynamics around FGM. So the training our and awareness, youth association and youth movement are stringent in the capacity, train on medical arguments, communication for behavior change, personal communication techniques, Full uh, chain. Uh, youth organization carry out on a raising activities for the government of FGM, development of uh, outreach action plan, uh, home visits, uh, talks, uh, radio program, uh, forums, integration of child watch and protection communities. So you can go ahead. So Nathaniel, if you can just wrap up now because of time, kindly. Okay. Okay. So uh, we have, can we with the challenge to be met with? You, you can go ahead. Uh, uh, and here I just want to say that uh, we have to create a youthful dynamic of lobbying against uh, the practice and include youth in the national technical communities to combat FGM and adaptation with youth of action taken to promote the abandonment of the FGM and pooling of resources between cross borders country to combat FGMs, support the establishment of an operational sub-regional coalition of youth CSO, uh, the, uh, the popularization of good for men on the ground against uh, FGM and last uh, in the web, Establish a artist members movement uh, against FGM and strengthen youth clubs as a forum for self-expression and teen advo advo advisory centers. Using social network as a vehicle of for information and advocacy and lead a digital advocacy on these issues, building bridge between Europe and Africa and the FGM. So. Um, 
thank you too much so uh, too much and this is a uh, uh, presentation that i will uh, like to share with you all right thank you so much nathaniel we will pro pro share this uh, presentations all the presentations that have been made with all uh, panel uh, with all the participants so we've come to the close of the the, the, the panelist session and i know we are uh, we're not doing very well in terms of time but I guess there has been a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of comments on the comment section. So um, there's a there's a question. Uh, Lolojo, I'm not sure is, Lolojo is still on the call. There's a question here about, um, you know, girls, uh, the return policy for girls who get pregnant. Do you want to mention that quickly, Bernadette? Yeah, um, I, I, I had um, uh, our sister uh, speaking about the challenges they are facing in their country when it comes to uh, return to school by girls who have gotten pregnant. And I just want to say that I'm very proud because Kenya government has uh, made it possible for girls who get pregnant to get children and then get back to school. Uh, so there's that policy and everybody, the young people should understand that there's that policy. Let us help the young girls at home. There are so many who are still at home even now if we can be able to see to it that they go back to school, then they would have a, a second chance of getting an education. And uh, I hope the other countries will also uh, be able to get such policies. And I'm happy to report also that uh, since um, President um, Sulu came into power in Tanzania, we are now able to have girls in Tanzania back to school after getting children. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, uh, Bernadette. So, um, so uh, because of time, I know it's, it's already 12.30, <laughs> but because again of the translation and all that, we, uh, we will just maybe still, maybe five, min five more minutes. Uh, so we're happy to take like two questions or two comments from the participants. So you can, uh, you can raise your hand and um, you can just raise your hand if you want to say something kindly. There's a raise hand button at the at the bottom of the chat box. Do you have any questions for the participants? Uh, uh, Jeremiah, can you see any hands? I had a couple of hands, but they have disappeared. So please raise the hands and we'll see them. I see five past Five, five participants have raised their hands. Um, uh, yeah, please, please go ahead and uh, finalize the section, uh, Jeremiah. All right. So uh, I see a couple of people have raised their hands. Please don't put it down. Joseph uh, Eco Boy, please make it very brief because you don't have much time. Go on. I, may, I allowed you to speak. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I come from a county where we have uh, a lot of FGM. I don't know how we can... Uh, we have a youth uh, network chapter, which I think they still need more support because uh, we have um, a very uh, rough terrain. <coughs> uh, and for us to operate, we need uh, a lot of support because uh, FGM is done secretly. So for us to be able to get to all the corners of, of the county, that is El Gemar Quet, we need a lot of support and we need, and we need support to sensitize the youth so that uh, they can be the group that will change the next generation. So maybe uh, we are still looking forward uh, maybe to development partners like UFPA to come up and support uh, the youth in our county. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Joseph. Um, I'm pretty sure there are contacts on the chat section. Uh, please check out uh, which ones uh, there are. Um, but yes, we have Aziz here as well as other representatives from the UNFPA. So you can just drop um, uh, a message for them on the panel section because of time. Thank you very much. Uh, Omahe uh, Zachary. Hello. All right. Are you hearing me? 
Yes, you can get you Omahe. Go on. Yeah, I'm Omahe Zachary from Kenya. That's from Migori County. And my question was, for example, some young girls usually get pregnant at an early age. And some of them maybe may refuse to go back to high school or primary. And how can we be able to help them so that they can be able to achieve their target? Maybe some of them want to go and study for maybe technical courses. So how can we be able to come out as a team so that we can empower them to get what they want? Are you All getting right. me? Yes, we can get you. Um, yes, I know there are so many dynamics in playing at you. Please mute the microphone. Please mute the microphone. All right. I, I, because of time, I'll just quickly go through it. And uh, for the panelists, to the panelists, please uh, add on it if I have forgotten anything. But there are chapters, as uh, Madam Nolojo had mentioned, in Migori County. And there are networks there already. So I'd recommend that uh, you get in touch and join those networks. I think it's going to be easy to coordinate because uh, we have different isolated cases. But to the panelists, if you have any comment on the same, uh, please free, feel free to uh, go on and answer it. Um, yes. So please raise your hand if, you, if there is a question that has been asked and you uh, would like to answer. Okay um so just know let, that they let are... me say something let, let me say something okay. i just want right. to talk directly to all the young people and uh, those who have started their own cbo's and geos at community level um we have the please let your contacts be at the offices of the county commissioners we have in place the county anti fgm steering committees and these committees are chaired by the county commissioners we will still soon be going around training and capacity building the county anti fgm steering committees Please don't be left behind. Go walk into the office of the county commissioners. Tell them what you are doing. Tell them that you are in the area of ending FGM and child marriage and ask them to include you in the county anti-FGM steering committees. Then also learn to work with others. And uh, because you know that when you work with others, you get more insights, you are able to reach out and get um, even more funding coming your way. I know people only think of UNFPA, UNICEF, World Vision, but I think there are so many grants, especially through Girls Not Brides. You can also be a member of Girls Not Brides, and then you will be getting emails coming to you uh, so that you can be able to see the grants that are available, send out your proposals, be able to join others who are in the same field with you. That will make you even be known and be able to have your space. Uh, use your voice as a young person and get yourself your space. Uh, let's not be people who stay at home and think things will come to you when you're there. Come out, work with the government agencies that are there with you at the county level, work with the county government, because like for the county and FGM steering committees, the CC, um, the CC, the CC gender is the co-chair of the county and FGM steering committee. Some of you don't even know who is the gender officer or the CC gender or the county commissioner or the DCC of your of your degree of your sub county please just go out and be known that you're doing something also work with the others who are already doing something in your areas like in migori we have muskana empowerment Korea. we have uh, this other young man he's called victor is he called victor or something like that Vincent. there are quite a number of people even in in in, in migori county on the Korea side uh be able to join others as you build your capacity and build your yourself then on the issue of education get going back to school the government has put in place day schools so many day schools in most of the areas uh, uh be able to um uh, be able to go to these schools uh, and see how these children can be can be taken in uh and it's very i think it's four thousand or four thousand five hundred per term this is money that can even be you can get from communities you can get from people at the community level who can give you 500 300 200 until you're able even to get uniform for that child and even pay that fees and that child just needs to walk into a school and be a day scholar then the government has also put in place the technical colleges we have now have so many technical colleges and what happens is that you just need to walk into a technical college or go online 
help them apply for the courses they want, they'll be given higher education loans board. When you go to those colleges, you'll be told how they are going to apply for the higher education loans board. Then they will join the institution and start their training. Let us know the, what the government is offering and take advantage. Let's take advantage of the government, um, uh, the, uh, the, what they are offering in terms of education and even technical colleges. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Madam Bernadette. Um, we have some question and answers, uh, some questions in the question and answer section. Uh, we promise to, uh, I would ask the panelists to just type the answers there so that we can also save time. I think we should give two more people, Ishmael, to just speak because of the time yeah. we have. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll just go Alimatu Jatani. I see you've raised up your hand. Alimatu? Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to um, congratulate the party and I'm a survivor. Uh, just to uh, emphasize on the Uh, uh, we have so many CBOs and uh, NGOs out there who are working with all of us, but I, I would uh, urge that they could uh, join together, just as uh, Madam Bernadette has said, so that we pull towards one direction and also involve survivors. The story of survival times, some of the survivors could help in uh, alleviating the FGM in villages because they, are, they know how it happened to them and some of the routes that have been used. And once they talk to these children and girls at school level or during holidays, they will uh, be able to assist them. Thank you very much and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you a lot, uh, Alimatu, uh, for that. i just get one more person um before we bring this to a close i see um agnes matagaro hello can you hear me yes we can hear you um i just want to say thank you very much to the panelists um for a well presented discussion that we've just had um, I just have a comment and a question. I remember like um, two months ago, I was in the village. I come from Nyamira County and I had an opportunity. I usually like to talk to young, to young children uh, between the ages of um, 11 and below. And I talked to this young boy and I told him that he should, um, he should be um, her sisters protect her um, against FGM. But the boy told me, um, I can't miss the opportunity to eat bread and soda. So I don't know how you can take, uh, I don't know how you see that um, because there are still these young children who, uh, who are happy when their sibling, when their sisters are circumcised. So for, that, for them, that is an opportunity to eat something they've never eaten yet, like they really, they really eat. And my question is, I didn't understand the connection between the UN, United Nations theme um, and today's discussion that we just had. So if you can help me on that. Thank Thanks you. a lot. I think I'll give that to Ishmael and uh, um, I probably will delegate to, uh, moving forward from there. Thank you. So, yeah, so just, just to bring that uh, question into perspective, can you hear me, Jeremiah? Yes, yes I can. can. Okay, so the theme of this year, International Youth Day, is transforming food systems, youth innovation for human and planetary health, um, with the aim of highlighting that the success of such a global effort will not be achieved without the meaningful participation of young people. So it has been acknowledged that there is a need for inclusive support mechanisms that ensure 
con that uh, ensure youth continue to amplify efforts collectively and individually to restore the planet and protect life while integrating biodiversity in the transformation of food systems. So with the world's population expected to increase by uh, 2 billion people in the next 30 years, it has been recognized by numerous stakeholders that simply producing a larger volume of healthier food more sustainably will not ensure human and planetary well-being. So other crucial challenges must also be addressed, such as the interlinkages embodied by the 2030 agenda, including poverty reduction, social inclusion, healthcare, biodiversity conservation, and climate change mitigation. So, so that is the connection, uh, looking at the other interlinkages that continue to uh, you know, bring about issues to do with poverty, you know, social uh, inclusion, uh, looking at issues to do with gender, promoting gender equality, all these issues. And of course, all the issues within the SDGs are related in one way or another. And so within this, the theme for this year, we've also had a today a presentation that connects the issue of climate change, um, you know, security and, and food security, and of course, uh, ending FGMC and child marriage. And there's more evidence that even in, uh, in the Northern Eastern area, for instance, of Kenya, you'll find that uh, because of the drought, um, you know, families are, 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 are selling their girls, yeah, so that uh, they can be able to, you know, um, you know, bring income home. So there is a connection between climate change and harmful practices. And again, as moving forward, we are going to continue doing more research to 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 unearth, uh, you know, this kind of findings. So thank you. Thanks a lot. I think uh, we should be wrapping up right now. Please keep uh, your questions coming. Uh, if you registered, you should see the email, um, Ishmael's email, and you can always drop him an email after this if there are any additional questions. Um, just wrapping this up, and if you allow me, Ishmael, um, I just uh, uh, share what we do at the Global Media Campaign because there are opportunities for campaigners to access grants um, in uh, certain uh, uh, rounds of uh, grant uh, application, um, calls for application. So uh, if you give me one minute, I'll just play a quick film and show you how you can sign up for the same. And... Uh, yeah, then we can easily work on the media to end FGM. So just a quick introduction about myself because I just joined in a few moments ago. My name is Jeremiah Kipainoi. I am uh, Director of Communications for the Global Media Campaign to end FGM. It's a London-based organization that works in eight African countries in the Horn of Africa, in East Africa, as well as West Africa. So I'm just going to quickly show you uh, a quick uh, film and um, where you can sign up for um, updates on when the uh, direct action grants will be going out so that you can apply. So um, I'll start off with the film, how to become a campaigner when you're working uh, with uh, the global media campaign. Five steps to becoming a media campaigner. Step 1. Get a smartphone to connect with other activists and set up a WhatsApp group to make your media plans. Step 2. Agree a list of important people who support your message that you want to get on radio and TV. These are influencers. It could be a religious leader, a doctor, a midwife, a village elder, a chief. They are people the community respects. Step 3. Apply for funding to the global media campaign to buy airtime. We call this a direct action media grant. Step 4. Call your local TV and radio stations. Tell them you have funds to get Dr. X or Imam Y on air. Now call the influencers and connect them with the broadcaster. Step 5. As their broadcast message reaches the community, record the transmission on your phone. Finally, share widely on social media. For more help on how to report on the numbers reached by your broadcast, on measuring the impact of your work and carrying out correct financial reporting, go to our Media Academy on Facebook. All right, thank you very much. I'll just quickly share how you can subscribe to, um, so that you can uh, always access the uh, call for direct action grants and also look at the, the work that other campaigners are doing. 
Um, so if you go to the global media campaign, like globalmediacampaign.org, that's the website, uh, you will see uh, reports by campaigners per country. Um, or you can just go to the news section. And uh, if you go to the news section, for example, and go to Kenya, let's say in this case, if you open an, an article, let's say, um, if you open any article and you read it, if you go up, you should see a pop-up that says uh, subscribe, and that applies to all other countries. Once you subscribe, you will be able to access um, direct action announcements, basically, that includes the direct action grants that go out um, every uh, um, every once in a while um, for uh, throughout the year, according to um, the surges that we have. So that's it from me. Uh, get in touch whenever you can, and uh, we'll be happy to help. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, for your time, for the panelists, for actually uh, your great insights, for the survivors who are able to share their personal stories. I know it's difficult, but again, it is difficult through dignity. Thank you so much. We really appreciate um, the, the, that you're soldiering on to ensure that no girl or woman suffers or dies from FGNC. So thank you so much for the, all the participants who created their time. We really apologize for this has gone longer because again, we had translations to do. And of course the, 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 the topic is, is hot. So let's keep tweeting that the, the, the hashtag is hashtag IYD 2021. There's also hashtag uh, uh, youth and FGM. And also there's international hashtag, hashtag youth lead. So lead is L-E-A-D. So let's keep, this is the youth week. So let's keep uh, tweeting. Thank you so much. And uh, let, we have come to an end for webinar. We will share this recording. So you'll always find it on, uh, on YouTube. And we will also reach out to everyone who subscribed. And also we will have a, a session, uh, a safeguarding session for the panelists who have been able to share their stories, just to check in with them to, 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 and, and to, to, to ensure that they're, they're okay and they're safe. So thank you so much and have a lovely evening.